All right, hello everyone. Today is June 2nd, 2021. I can't believe it's June already. <laughs> um, and this is the Atlanta FileMaker Developers Group. Our presenter today is Stephen Casas, and he's going to be presenting on using microservices with FileMaker. Uh, Stephen, please take it away. Hi, David, and uh, I want to say thank you to you for uh, having me, and uh, also to uh, Jeremy had told me that he threw uh, my name toward you, so I want to say thank you to Jeremy as well, um, and uh, everybody who's watching. Uh, really hope that we're able to kind of bounce some ideas off of each other. Um, I really wasn't a hundred percent sure what type of audience I should prepare for with this, but um, I uh, kind of wanted to break down the session into a. Uh, basically a two-part process. The first part is a video that I prepared to kind of introduce uh, everybody to the concept of uh, what Docker is. Um, uh, how many, uh, I guess, of, of the attendees today, how many of you guys have, are, are familiar with Docker or what uh, containerization is? Um, I'm not actually sure how to get feedback out of Google Meet, but I guess figure that out. <laughs> yeah, everyone, you can unmute yourselves and talk in here too. Um, yeah, I've used Docker before for deploying applications. Uh, OK, very cool. And, uh, for sharing development. Uh, setups. Excellent. Um, well, I, uh, I I'm a huge fan of it in terms of being able to uh, kind of very quickly get things uh, up and running. Uh, in particular, I have really grown fond of Docker Desktop, which I think was released in early 2020. Um, it may maybe late 2019. Um, and kind of tying that to my FileMaker server installations for my customers. Uh, what I continuously run into is that every time I get a really nice microservice running on their host system, uh, an update comes along and, and kills it. And that was just really, really uh, kind of tearing apart uh, any of the foundations that I was able to build for all those sort of little ancillary projects that the customers would ask for. And uh, it was happening on such a recursive basis that uh, you know the obvious answer would have been, hey, you know, let's buy a cloud server and get stuff uploaded to there. Um, but uh, of course, the customer never wants to pay for that. Um, so Docker Desktop really uh, has been a a nice addition to my FileMaker development workflow in that uh, it is a simple inst installer. It doesn't really take a whole lot to get running. It's actually a, a classic installer uh, where you can follow the dialog boxes, almost like a wizard that you'd have in Mac OS or Windows. And then by the time you're done with it, you've got a really uh, robust framework for uh, sustainable microservices. So um, if uh, it seems like most of us uh, in, in the, the, the group today aren't uh, too familiar with it, but uh, I uh, did want to go ahead and give an introduction to it. So uh, last night I put together a, a little bit of a video for you guys and uh, provided you can actually hear me once we switch over, um, we'll go ahead and uh, see what that sounds like. So um, basically what I'd like to do is kind of break down the session into uh, those two parts. Uh, we'll start with the introduction video that uh, I put together. And uh, then after that, we can move into uh, focusing on uh, some of the microservices that you guys want to see. I have a couple of demos that uh, are ready to go. And uh, since it is kind of a more intimate setting, uh, I'd like to go ahead and uh, kind of get some input and see where uh, everybody's head is at as far as what they would like to see a little bit more out of in terms of uh, where their FileMaker solutions uh, need to uh, need to maybe get a little bit of extra ancillary support uh, with things that aren't necessarily built into the existing framework. So um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, play that video back now. Uh, it's about uh, six to seven minutes. And uh, hopefully that goes well. David, uh, I trust that you'll uh, kind of ping me if the audio levels are a little off. I know we had some trouble with that. So uh, just uh, shoot me a message or uh, scream in my ear. And uh, hopefully we'll uh, get, uh, get that off to a good start. Anyway. Uh, let's have it. Uh, the next scene that you guys get will be in my what used to be my kitchen. Welcome to what's supposed to be my kitchen. If I'm being honest, I've probably spent more hours in here soldering than I have actually cooking, but that's not important right now. As you might have guessed, I'm standing where my air fryer should be so that we can talk about Docker, that weird cargo ship whale looking thing that's running the internet. Now, before I dive in, I want to highlight that not all of the comparisons that I'm going to be making today are exact. So if there are any keyboard warriors out there, just know that this video is more geared toward beginners, and sometimes we need to make analogies so that we can first understand the basics of concepts to then move on to the more advanced topics. 
Anyway, it's hard to discuss Docker without first understanding why we need it. So instead of starting by looking at the solution and then getting to the problem that it fixes, let's of course dive first into the problem so that we can understand the fundamentals of what Docker really solves for us. You see, rapid application platforms like FileMaker are great at what they do. They help us deliver swift and robust apps to our customers, and they help us respond to changes in real time as the customers need them. Occasionally though, the customer may ask for something that's beyond the scope of what the platform is capable of doing. And when that happens, we usually seek out a plugin or try to engineer a custom solution. Where we run into trouble, however, is the way we go about implementing those ancillary solutions. Most developers will try to leverage their existing host system to make the most of the resources that they've got. And this usually isn't a problem until things start to change. This is a game of Don't Break the Ice that I bought at Goodwill for $3. It's a children's game, but it's also the perfect way to describe how to build sustainable infrastructure for our app's ancillary services. You see, it's made up of a bunch of individual little cubes which form the surface of the ice. These cubes are held in place by tension against each other, and they all ultimately hold up this penguin, ostensibly keeping him from falling into the frozen lake. The game ships with two plastic mallets, and during each turn, a player will knock out a single cube of ice, repeating this process until one of them eventually commits a crime against nature and drowns the penguin in the lake. This should keep your child occupied for about 13 minutes every four months, or right up until the point that you step on one of the cubes in the middle of the night, and the game winds up in my kitchen after you donated it to Goodwill. Thanks for that. Today, though, we're not playing to win. Instead, we can think of the surface of the ice as our server's operating system. Each individual cube represents a different component of that operating system. Suppose this one is a network driver and this one is a Swift API. Maybe this one is SSH. Each individual component supports other components and they all together make our operating system. Somewhere on here, you've installed FileMaker Server to host your business app and the customer's happy. The application is running and everything is working great. One day though, the customer asks for something a little bit special and you decide that you need to do a little research to figure out what the best solution is gonna be. After you've complete your research, you determine that PHP is what needs to be installed, so you install it on the host system. Again, the customer is happy and everything is working great. Your custom solution is running without a hitch. However, it's June and WWDC is just on the horizon and Apple is planning to release a new version of macOS. Following in the footsteps of Big Sur, Catalina, and many of the other places that inspire them, they'll be releasing macOS Compton. It's chock full of security features, and to support this, Apple engineers have decided to cut out some of the binaries that they think no longer meet the cut. Unfortunately, your PHP installation needs one of these binaries, and while it's probably inappropriate to shoot an elephant, <coughs> PHP stops working, and the binary gets cut. Your service is now permanently offline, and if you've already upgraded the customer server, you're now going to be scrambling to try to find a way to bring that back online quickly. Oftentimes, because these changes are sudden, there's not a lot of documentation available to tell you how you can go about restoring that, and most of the research you'll be doing will be in time with everyone else who has the same problem as you. Now, this problem is nothing new. Perhaps the most egregious case would be in the case of macOS Server 10.14, when Apple decided to defenestrate basically 90% of the server app. If your organization depended on that DNS module, well, that was too bad, and their answer was, figure it out. Of course, while it seems like I'm giving Apple a hard time, that's just because most of my customers operate with Mac-based environments. Microsoft can, and has, made similar decisions which have had just as devastating of consequences. So how do we guard against something like this without telling the customer that they can never upgrade their server again? Well, we have a few options in this respect. We could buy another server, but the reality of the situation is that FileMaker server is the only thing running on our current server, and at that, it's a pretty underutilized resource. A virtual machine would be a perfect solution for this, because once you get it up and running and configured exactly as you want, you can set it up and leave it as long as you need to, only upgrading when you see it fit, or sometimes never at all. But what if you need more than just PHP? Suppose you also need Node.js. Well, that's two virtual machines, and you only have so many processor cores and only so much RAM that you can hand out before you start to slow down FileMaker Server, which is your primary business application platform. Does it even make sense to set aside a whole processor core for just PHP? It doesn't really need that much computing power, and most of that computing power would be going towards maintaining a virtual operating system whose components you and PHP aren't really using. What if there is a way to virtualize only the service and the things it needs to function? Could we slim down that service to the point where it could actually share its resources with other services? 
Well, that's exactly what Docker aims to do, and it does that through things called containers. No, not these kinds of containers. If we now think of the surface of the ice as the virtual operating system on which our service is running, we can actually start to chip away individually at the pieces we don't need. This, of course, will free up resources for something else to run. Now, we could, of course, do this piece by piece, but I think I've got a much better tool for getting this job done. Now, while that may have seemed just a little bit dramatic, it's actually a great way to start from scratch. And that's exactly what the genius engineers who develop Docker and BusyBox do when they develop lightweight service containers to operate in the most efficient way possible. Using this approach, they can add a service's dependencies piece by piece until they have exactly what they need. No more and no less. So if we now think of this empty space as resources that are available to our virtual system, it looks like we actually have the space to support something else. Could we use this to run something in tandem with PHP? Say, maybe our Node.js server? Of course we can. With the ability to add just the components we need to operate both containers, we can make the most of our available resources and our available computing power. And if you'll notice, Node.js is connected directly to PHP, but that's a conversation for another video. For now, let's head back to my desk. We'll review what we've learned and figure out how we're going to apply it in a real-world situation. So I'm hoping that that actually played back correctly and I wasn't just on mute the entire time. Um, uh, can I get a thumbs up or thumbs down from David or anybody else? Yeah, everything played through fine. Outstanding, very cool. Uh, so uh, that's a pretty short and a, a very, I would say, diluted uh, summary on containers. Um, really, the major takeaways from it that I hope everybody kind of sees is that uh, it allows you to make the most of the resources that you have available to you. Um, and for um, a lot of us, I, I know we haven't really embraced a lot of the uh, Claris Cloud, and we're still hosting on-prem. Uh, I do for all of my customers uh, because we're in rural Texas, and uh, that's really the only option. Um, but I know that uh, a lot of others do it for you know privacy reasons, for uh, you know HIPAA compliance, uh, all sorts of other reasons. Um, and really, at the end of the day, on-prem, I, I, I think, is just kind of has been the, the, the choice of, uh, of most developers uh, just in that it, it gives the most level of control. Um, so uh, I, I don't want to just breeze through things because that was a lot of information uh, sort of at once. Um, uh, what, uh, what are our thoughts so far as far as uh, uh, the group here? Um, it is, does this seem like a technology that you might be able to take advantage of um, in your solutions? Or do you see a particular place where, where that might fit in? Uh, definitely could. I have a feeling you're going to show us some great examples of how to use containers. <laughs> I hope so, yeah. <laughs> um, it, it definitely is a... Uh... It definitely is a, a very nice technology because it establishes that consistency. Um, I uh, can recall several times when, uh, like I said, I've installed various microservices uh, to try and get things, uh, you know, fulfill whatever request it was that the customer was asking for. And uh, it, uh, it doesn't always work out because those, uh, those dependencies that we rely on uh, can disappear at any point. Uh, I think in uh, macOS uh, Mojave, I think 10.14, we lost FTP. And a lot of people relied on that. Uh, there are all sorts of ways that you can uh, try to kind of sideload that and get things going. But uh, ultimately, uh, it, it, it just kind of sets up a rocky foundation for what needs to be a very robust uh, business app if it's running in production. So um, yes, uh, it, with that in mind, uh, I, I definitely do have a, a couple of demos. Um, web scraping is probably one of the most popular uh, requests that I, I see a lot in, in the forum. Um, and so that's kind of where I'd like to start. Um, and uh, we can, of course, since it, since it is sort of a, a small group today, if you guys have any uh, particular sites that you'd be interested in seeing how you might be able to go about getting information off of them, uh, we can have that conversation. Um, I've got an example, but uh, as long as uh, I'm asking, is there uh, any information that uh, you guys would like to integrate in your uh, solutions that you'd like to kind of see um, that, you, that you'd like to see how you might get access to that. Anybody, feel free to speak, speak up. There's not anything that I'm trying to do scraping on, but if you need some examples of sites with data, I'm sure everyone Oh, should. I've got plenty. OK, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so th there's a couple of, uh, of things to that. I'll go ahead and pull up uh, um, 
let's see if I can get my, my desktop here. Um, there, there's a couple of, uh, of tricks to web scraping, of course. And uh, am I still audible, just so I'm, I'm clear on this? Yep, sound fine. OK, outstanding. Uh, th th there's a couple of uh, things to be considerate of when we do any scraping. Uh, and that is, of course, uh, whether or not it is compliant with the terms uh, and conditions of the site uh, that we're interested in. So uh, it, it took a yeah, One a thing I'll mention of... real quick through here. Um, sure. I think this is going, I don't know if you're using OBS or something like that uh, to share your screen. It does look pretty blurry. Um, if you do the uh, we screen can swap over to uh, through here, yeah. if you do present now, it might come through clearer. Uh, do I get to select which monitor? Yes. Yep. OK, very good. Okay. Yeah, I didn't realize that that was going to come in blurry like that. Okay, I think we're good. Make sure we've got that. Uh, it is not permitting that. One second. I think running through the camera, I might just have a very limited resolution, or it's doing some compression or something. Well, I scaled it down because I know the last time I did one of these, it was uh, I, I use a 5K monitor, and nobody could see what was on screen because it was too small. And now I don't think it's scaling up, unfortunately. Uh, let's see. Okay, we will try that again. Okay, hopefully we have a picture now. There we go. Yep, and we can actually read some of the text on there. Outstanding. Yes, that's an improvement, isn't it? Um, okay, very good. Uh, so. Uh, like I was saying, there's uh, a lot of sites that uh, we really want to get data from. Um, uh, usually one of the requests that uh, I, I find very often is uh, people want to get stock information or uh, some kind of pricing information, um, especially into customers' quoting systems. So uh, one, of the, one of the more popular vendors uh, in the manufacturing industry is uh, McMaster Car. And I've had a lot of uh, customers who do their quoting through uh, FileMaker ask if they could get uh, information off of the site. And one of the things you really have to be mindful of when you are uh, scraping information from a site is whether or not uh, they actually allow you to do that. So um, it kind of goes back to the old uh, saying, which is, you know, just because uh, you can do something doesn't mean you should. And uh, that uh, is defined pretty clearly here in the terms and conditions of uh, the actual acceptable use of the site. And pretty much any modern site that you have is going to have this type of information on it. And uh, whether or not you're allowed to access that type of information is uh, pretty, uh, pretty clearly defined if you just search for the word uh, scrape. Uh, a lot of the terms and conditions actually disallow this. So it's not that we couldn't do it, it's that we shouldn't do it. Uh, however. Uh, where you find this, uh, you generally also find that the site offers an API um, that can be integrated in another way uh, to be able to get the information out of the site. So if uh, the customer really wants to get uh, that pricing information inside of their FileMaker app, uh, I know a site like McMaster Car generally has all of that uh, available in a much nicer package uh, that uh, we can access through a REST API and integrate with the FileMaker insert from URL script step versus having to kind of write our own logic for it. So uh, most sites will offer that. Um, but uh, the key is, you know, if, if they ask you not to do it, uh, generally um, don't go about that. There are some exceptions that I follow with, but I'll, I'll, I'll talk about those later. Um, in light of all of that, uh, it was actually pretty difficult to find a site that uh, wasn't uh, going to complain about that. I had to really bang my head against the wall trying to figure out uh, what first would be a use case for the data that I could get my hands on um, and where the 
uh, apex would be that uh, it was data that I was allowed to get my hands on uh, according to the uh, terms of use on the site. And what I found was uh, the uh, Electronic Reliability Council of Texas uh, actually doesn't have any uh, terms of use on their site, uh, but they do publish the uh, current prices at which electricity is trading um, here uh, in Texas. So uh, that's what we're going to be scraping today. Um, and yeah, these guys aren't really popular right now. Um, but we're going to go ahead and be getting some of the information off of their site. And it's a really, really good example of uh, where scraping can come in handy uh, because they have these really nice tabular layouts that we can reference here. And most of the time when we're looking for information uh, it's always going to be numbers like this in a table that we want to integrate into our uh, current application. Um, so this is the information that uh, I have that uh, we're going to you know, try to collect. And uh, we're going to be doing this in a, uh, a microservice that's going to be powered by uh, Docker Desktop. So some traditional approaches to being able to fetch this type of information is uh, within FileMaker. And I'll just go ahead and pop into FileMaker Pro down here. Within FileMaker, we've always been able to use the insert from URL script step to kind of collect information. So if I just create a blank app here, we can kind of see what that would look like. And here we're really going to be starting from scratch so that we can follow step by step. And I'm just going to create an empty text field that we can load some data into here. And we pop into our script editor. And we run the insert from URL script step. I can grab the URL here and throw that into our dialog and make sure that we're throwing it into here. And we can actually examine what gets populated when we run the script step. I don't think I have a record created, so, oh, yes, we do. Throw that in there. And we can see that we actually get the raw HTML of the site. Um, well, that uh, doesn't really do us a whole lot of good uh, if we get into FileMaker because uh, FileMaker is not really well suited, uh, at least natively. There are plenty of plugins, of course, I'm sure that you could add on, uh, but it's not really well suited to be able to parse this type of information um, out of a page. Uh, this is definitely modern HTML, which is a der uh, derivative of XML. But uh, even then, uh, FileMaker has uh, kind of struggled in the past to be able to get information out of stuff like this. I've seen some pretty, pretty clever approaches, um, but really all of this is best parsed out um, in a browser environment that is designed to interpret this. Uh, so. We could technically find the information that we're looking for. And since I'm in San Antonio, um, I'm going to be looking for the uh, settlement point at uh, CPS, which is City Public Service here in San Antonio. Um, and so I would always want the latest price here um, to see what uh, electricity is trading at in my area. Um, and so this is the value that we're going to be looking at. We're looking for the last row of the table um, and this particular column here. Um, we could theoretically uh, go through and start looking for consistencies uh, within the information that we've got here and try to create some pretty clever calculations. And uh, if anyone is ever interested, I do have a uh, very, I would call it nothing short of bloated, uh, script library that actually is designed uh, to parse uh, XML line by line. Works pretty well, but uh, I would say it's also uh, quite slow. And I would wager that pretty much any calculation that we'd come up with that would be native would also be quite slow. Uh, so what we want to do is kind of offload this task to something that's better suited to it. Uh, FileMaker, as I said earlier in uh, the intro video, is suited to a lot of really, really cool tasks. And it lets us get up and running very quickly. But it does reach a point where um, it's not the best tool for the job. Um, and uh, in that respect, uh, there are other things that we can delegate that to. Um, that's where uh, Docker Desktop kind of steps in. If we wanted to, we could technically, um, let's say this is my FileMaker server. Um, it's not. I've got a copy of FileMaker server running here uh, that we'll touch on later. Uh, but 
if we wanted to, we could theoretically install Node.js or PHP or any other um, uh, ancillary language onto our master system. And uh, from that point forward, we could go ahead and uh, parse out that information using JavaScript or any other language um, that we have at our disposal. But a, again, we run into that issue um, where we're throwing a dependency uh, into our master system, which is subject to receiving updates. And th those updates could break anything that we decide to install, um, or they could leave it intact. Uh, it, it really is uh, an unpredictable situation. Uh, where Docker Desktop kind of steps in is that uh, it provides us with a place to put services uh, where we can guarantee their environment. And it uh, comes with this really nice dashboard here um, we are going to have to touch on the terminal a little bit to get things running, but uh, it's very, very, very brief, and then uh, we're back into a nice UI. Um, but what you're effectively doing, uh, if you recall from the video, is you're setting up conditions that you can count on uh, to be long-term and lasting. Um, and if the question is, well, what do I do if Docker suddenly stops running? Well, the nice thing about that is that this is a tool that is uh, you know, just as ingrained into the lives of developers as FileMaker is into ours. So when things stop working in that regard, uh, people are generally very quick to respond. Uh, Docker is a huge company, and they have uh, every interest in being able to keep their software running and keep their developers happy. Uh, so. Uh, in that regard, uh, it is uh, something that uh, we can count on. It's uh, something that's used by uh, companies all over the world, and it's not going away anytime soon. So um, the installer for this is uh, quite simple. Uh, on a Mac, it literally ships as a disk image that you can download, and then you just drag it on into uh, your applications folder. Uh, on a PC, I can't speak to that because I haven't touched one in years, but um, I'm sure they've got a, a lovely workflow for uh, you Windows users out there. Um, anyway, there are several ways that we could decide to scrape this website, um, but one of the more popular approaches um, that uh, I get asked about a lot uh, is Node-RED. And I am not a Node-RED developer um, by any uh, stretch of the imagination, but I did touch on it uh, briefly uh, just so that I could kind of see what all of the buzz was about. And it's really uh, quite robust, actually. It allows you to kind of uh, get these really nice um, chart-driven workflows where you're able to establish um, a process for the things that you want to accomplish. So uh, in the in, in respect to FileMaker, which is a, a low-code, you know, rapid application development environment, uh, Node-RED is kind of an extension of that. And if you're unfamiliar with uh, code-based programming languages, if you're, you're not comfortable with JavaScript, uh, really, this is a, a great place to start. Uh, I would say that I definitely had a little bit of a learning curve getting used to some of the syntax, but if you're going in fresh, uh, this is definitely a good place to start rather than trying to uh, code something from scratch. Uh, the difference between trying to do that versus starting here is pretty substantial. There's, uh, Despite all of the really nice uh, workflows that exist now for developers that want to get up and running very quickly, um, I, I would wager that there's uh, it's very difficult to have something that provides all of the scaffolding that Node-RED does um, and lets you get up and running very, very quickly. Uh, so we'll go ahead and take a look at that. Um, uh, as I uh, discussed earlier in the video, um, what we're going to be setting up is a container. And a container is uh, really where everything uh, is, is contained. It, it, is, it is a perfect word to describe what it is. Um, everything that you need to be able to provide the service that you uh, wish to launch is going to be within that particular object, which we refer to as the container. Um, now, obviously, if we're building uh, something like that, as we discussed earlier, we need to know what dependencies are uh, going to uh, go into that. Uh, if we want to provide that service and we want it to be the most uh, spelt and uh, slim service that we uh, can make uh, while not taking up too many resources from our system that we now have to share with FileMaker, uh, then we need to make sure that we're not uh, bloating it with uh, additional services that it doesn't need. Um, well, that process is quite simple, actually, for us because uh, there are thousands of pre-built containers uh, where people have worked really, really hard to make things as light as possible. Um, if we head over to hub.docker.com, 
uh, we can browse through a really nice catalog of all of these. And I know already that I'm looking for Node Red. So we can, and it's going to yell at me because it's a space between here. I know that we're looking for Node Red, and I can see that there's already a uh, pre built container for it uh, where we can get up and running very, very quickly. Um, most of the official containers, which are those that are sponsored by uh, the actual developers of a given project, will have these really nice instructions that you can follow along with. Um, so if you're looking for something in particular, like let's say we were looking for a PHP container, then we could pop into here and also have, uh, well, this one's a little bit of a mess, so this might be a bad example. I, it clears up here. Um, but uh, most of uh, the official containers are, are really quite nice in that they uh, kind of help you get up and running by providing the commands that we're going to need to issue. Um, I realize that not everybody is uh, you know, as comfortable in the terminal as uh, everyone else. Uh, so it's, it's nice to kind of have these references uh, that really helps uh, to get things um, right off the ground. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and drag over my terminal window here, and we're going to see how we can kind of get up and running here. Um, if we look at our dashboard again here, and uh, again, that is a, a really nice UI that we have. Uh, while we have uh, access to be able to see what's running, uh, we can't actually start a container from here. We do have to go over to our terminal. Um, I'm using iTerm uh, just because I prefer it, but uh, you can use the native Mac terminal application, or if you're on a PC, you can use the command prompt there or PowerShell, whichever you prefer. And from here, we really just need to paste in uh, what we see. So I'm going to go ahead and highlight this here, and I'm going to copy it. And we're going to pop back over to my terminal, and I'm going to paste that on in there. So I could just run this, and I know that it would work because uh, all of my dependencies have been provided for, and this is robust, it's tested, and it's running in a good environment. But it, I really wouldn't be doing much for uh, the audience today if I didn't kind of break down what's happening. So um, if you're looking to use Docker desktop or Docker in general to uh, get running with uh, any sort of microservices, uh, you're likely going to be running uh, one command pretty frequently, and that's this uh, docker run command. Um, and what this is uh, effectively saying is it's telling the system that uh, we want to run something. We want to create a container for a particular service. Um, and that's uh, basically what that is always going to be saying. Where you, where you see this run, you're telling uh, Docker that you want uh, something, to, something to be created and for it to continuously run. Um, I'm actually going to use a different version of this that I have saved. Uh, if we were to, oops, if we were to run this with the .it, uh, the dash it flag here, uh, we would actually kind of get into a little bit of trouble in that uh, it would not, uh, it, it would run right here in the terminal. We don't want that. So uh, this it this uh, tells the container that we want it to run interactively. So any feedback that it would have for us, we would see here in the terminal, which isn't necessarily bad, but uh, that's not uh, not really what I want for the time being. So uh, instead, I'm going to go ahead and uh, use my own variant here. We're going to use this dash d flag, which is saying that we want it to run detached. Now, when we say that we want it to run detached, uh, some people would argue also that this is uh, stands for daemonized. It's, I, I don't really care. Effectively, it comes down to uh, the same story, which is that uh, it's not going to be running in the foreground. Um, and in that way, we can kind of just set it, forget about it, and uh, we don't really have to worry about it. Um, the next flag is referring to the port publishing. So. Um, if uh, you're familiar at all with uh, the HTTP protocol, uh, you're probably familiar with uh, the fact that it generally tends to run over port 80. Well, if we're running this on our FileMaker master system, then we already know that uh, it occupies port 80, and uh, it does so uh, pretty permanently. Uh, so port 80 is not going to be available to us. Uh, natively, Node Red does not uh, operate on port 80. It uses this uh, 1880 uh, port here instead, which uh, generally, I would say, save for some very uh, specific use cases, uh, is not going to be occupied on uh, the system that you're, you're running. Um, when we look at this, uh, this particular syntax here, uh, on the left side, you have the uh, 
the port that you are wanting to expose from within the container, and then on the right side, what you're going to be publishing to, so um, the internal external. So when we choose to access Node-RED later on, we'll be using this 1880 here. Um, and then the, whoops, the name of the container that we're going to be running, I just have mine called Node-RED test. And then here we actually have uh, what we're going to be pulling from. So if we look at uh, the actual container uh, official name here. Uh, it's uh, from a publisher called Node-RED, and the name they've given the container is Node-RED. So this is the name that we'll see in our application, in our dashboard over here. And this is telling uh, Docker, which is running on our machine, where to get the information to go ahead and execute that. So uh, that's how that command works. Um, and it's a pretty standard syntax uh, that you're going to use for anything that's pre-built. Uh, if I hit return, it's going to do a little bit of work. And you'll see that immediately uh, the uh, dashboard over here responded. And we've got a nice little green enunciator indicating that uh, it is, in fact, running. Um, this uh, string of text here uh, is going to be the actual container serial number. Uh, nothing that we would have to keep track of unless we were uh, trying to do this on a much larger scale. Um, and even then, this is uh, something you can access later on. Um, if you're running this for the first time, um, I obviously have run this in the past, uh, but if you're running this for the first time, there's a really good chance uh, that, uh, well, there's an absolute chance that uh, it's going to have to actually pull the uh, information uh, from uh, Docker Hub. Uh, and when it's pulling uh, information, what that is is it's uh, going through and it's collecting all of those dependencies that we talked about. So everything that uh, Docker needs to be able to run this service, it's going to pull that down. Um, and you'll see that uh, come through as downloads. It'll let you know about the progress as it's going along. Uh, generally, like I said, most of these are slimmed down quite well. So they don't tend to take but more than uh, a, a few minutes at most to download. Uh, this pull command that uh, you see here on the Docker website, uh, that gets run as part of our uh, Docker run command. So um, you can completely skip through that process uh, if you'd like and really just skip to this command or the one that I used. Um, well, now we can see that, in fact, uh, this service is running, and it's sitting here on my Mac on my local machine. So I should be able to access it if I hit up localhost on port 1880. So back to Firefox. And we can see that we've got a fresh instance of Node-RED. Um, and uh, it's running pretty well. Uh, if I go ahead and... Uh, uh, start playing around with things, it looks like, yeah, it's pretty functional. So um, like I was saying earlier, this is a really good place to start um, if you're unfamiliar with uh, anything like JavaScript or PHP. This this gives you a pretty good place to, to get going with things. Uh, I'm still uh, a little unfamiliar with some of its idiosyncrasies, but I've uh, been pretty happy with the way that uh, it works. Um, and one of the nice things about it is that all of the different workflows that you're able to set up inside of it uh, it's kind of self-documenting. Um, I've definitely written more than one microservice for uh, a couple of different customers. And one of the things that I always run into is it's uh, as they request more features, it can kind of become very difficult to uh, keep track of what's what. Uh, by delegating a lot of that into Node-RED, I found a, a lot of success in being able to just kind of keep track of uh, of what I'm doing and know uh, where to go when I need to troubleshoot something. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and import a workflow that I've got. Um, but before we do that, uh, we should. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and familiarize uh, ourselves with uh, one of the most basic uh, components here, which is the HTTPN. Um, if you want to access uh, any of your workflows from within FileMaker, uh, it's uh, really important that you familiarize yourself with this because in order for us to utilize our insert from URL script step, uh, we need to have a URL that we can actually point it to. Um, and that's what this is going to set up for us. So if I double click on this, um, if you're familiar with the HTTP pr protocol, these should look kind of familiar. Um, this is a, a GET request. Uh, you may have also heard of a POST request. And then uh, the rest of these are a little more specific to when we're dealing with database and uh, kind of CRUD operations. Um, but the default request that gets sent uh, when we use the insert from URL uh, request, uh, I'm sorry, script step, is uh, going to be a GET request. It's uh, saying go get some information from somewhere. 
Um, and when we set up this particular node, uh, what we're doing is we are uh, creating an endpoint um, at our node red host uh, that we can name. So uh, because I'm looking for information about energy, then I'm going to go ahead and name this forward slash energy. And this name property down here is something that you'll find on every single node. Um, it is just basically a label that you can give to uh, the uh, individual element uh, within your workflow. So I'm just going to say establish HTTP endpoint, and we'll say done. Uh, on its own, this really isn't going to do much for us, uh, but uh, just to kind of see what happens, I'm going to pull up HyperNAP here. Um, and HyperNAP is an app that you can get on the App Store if you don't already have a REST client that you're using, uh, of which I actually have several done here. Uh, Insomnia is one of, that's really popular. Um, I think a lot of people um, use Postman. Um, I could not get used to it, so I don't. Um, but a lot of people uh, really like it. Um, so that's another option. Uh, if you're looking for something really lightweight, um, uh, HyperNAP is kind of nice because it just kind of gets you up and running. Um, but if you're doing any long-term work, I cannot recommend it because it gets frustrating very, very quickly. But for a uh, simple test like this, uh, it tends to work pretty well. Um, if I uh, post that, we're not going to get anything. I'm sorry. If I uh, run a GET request against that, we're not going to actually get anything because we currently haven't deployed our workflow. So if I hit Deploy here, uh, we'll get a successfully deployed. And if we try that again, it's just going to hang. And the reason that it's hanging is because we haven't actually given it a closure. So uh, we don't actually have uh, any data that we are returning uh, to our actual request. So uh, we can utilize any number of these here uh, to go ahead and uh, return some data to our actual request. And in that way, we will say HTTP response. And we can tie one to the other here. If we're going to be using something that starts with an HTTP request, we always need to return a response. So uh, because that's how we're going to be getting data in and out of FileMaker with our insert from URL script step, uh, we uh, need to be mindful that uh, there needs to be a start and an endpoint. And in fact, you can't actually use this particular element in your workflow uh, unless, uh, unless you have that, uh, that endpoint. So uh, I'm just going to go ahead and return right now a status code of 200. And we'll say return result to request. Let's we'll say return response. And hit done. And this 200 uh, here, if you're not familiar with HTTP status codes, that's kind of just uh, like an acknowledgment code saying, uh, yes, this was successful um, and uh, no error. Um, I think everybody's kind of universally familiar with the uh, classic 404 code, which means uh, not found. Um, so uh, class 200 errors uh, generally indicate a positive disposition to whatever request it is that you put forward. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and redeploy here. And if I come back over to HyperNAP, where it's got a nice error for me telling me that it timed out, and I hit play, we're going to get back code 200. It's telling us that everything is OK. If we look in the body of the response, of course, it is empty because we didn't actually send anything back. But we can at least see that our server is responding quite nicely. Uh, similarly, if we were to change our address here to our local host address running node red, I can go ahead and hit OK, save it, run it. And we see that we actually get back the exact same thing that we saw in HyperNAP. So now we've got a good uh, mechanism to be able to get information from our FileMaker solution, I'm sorry, uh, from our workflow into our FileMaker solution. And uh, this really, really, really is uh, a nice um, a nice workflow to kind of fall into because Node-RED does provide a lot of really robust uh, mechanisms to be able to get things done. And uh, like I said, we're going to be looking at uh, doing some web scraping today. So uh, let's go ahead and see how we do that. Um, I'm not going to bore everybody too much with uh, building the actual workflow um, uh, from scratch. I have it done already, and we'll just kind of walk through the uh, the, the flow of it. Uh, before I can do that, I'm going to need to bring in one piece that we are going to be using. So if I come over here to Settings, 
and I come over to our palette and click on the install tab. Um, this is where you can go to get additional uh, pieces that can empower your application. And what I'm looking for is something called Cheerio. Um, and Cheerio is a framework uh, that actually, if we read here, it says a node read node to parse XML and HTML and map to a JavaScript object. Uh, and that's, uh, that's what Cheerio is, is it's uh, designed to uh, read all of that XML, that HTML, and make meaningful sense out of it. Um, I use it uh, a lot in actually one of my uh, applications, I'm sorry, frameworks that I have on my GitHub page, uh, and uh, it's uh, quite robust. So we're going to go ahead and install that, and I'm going to confirm that up here. It's going to do a little bit of work, and we're going to say that's fine. Uh, now, you don't have to use this. There are several other ways to go about what we're going to be doing today, but um, that was the first thing that I thought of when I wanted to do this, so uh, we're going to be using that. Um, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and paste in one of the workflows that I've created for this so that we can go ahead and get up and running very, very quickly. So if I go ahead and paste that in, and I say import. And we'll go ahead, and I'm actually going to clear this one out, and we'll start here. Uh, so if we take a look at uh, what got pasted in, uh, we can see a series of different elements here. And uh, again, I would like to take this moment to highlight that I am not a Node-RED developer, um, and that uh, there's probably a much more efficient way to do this within this framework. I can tell you how I would do it if I were writing pure uh, JavaScript or TypeScript, but uh, within Node-RED, uh, this is what I came up with just very quickly, and I know that it works. Um, and really, I think that that's... Uh, that, that, that's the most important thing when you're building things like this, is that at the end of the day, does it work? Um, and if the answer is yes, then you're in good condition. Um, it doesn't have to be perfect as long as it gets the job done. Um, and that's, uh, that, that's true for a lot of the things that I, I think we get to add to our solutions. Um, because the workflow for getting things into and out of FileMaker isn't always uh, the most elegant uh, the most elegant uh, mechanism. Uh, this one is is pretty nice in that uh, we've got all of these nice things that uh, integrate with the insert from URL script step and then the HTTP protocol. So it, it's it's quite nice that we have those things available to us. But uh, as you dive into, if you decide that this is something that you want to be able to leverage inside of your applications, uh, don't get hung up too much on the syntax or the semantics of things. Uh, just kind of go in feet first and uh, get going. Um, so we can see that I've got, uh, as my first element, uh, that same endpoint that we had earlier where we're establishing the way that we're actually going to allow this particular application to export information. Uh, we've got the uh, URL here as uh, energy, and uh, that's going to be the entry point for our actual workflow. Uh, the next thing that uh, we're looking at is we're going to actually send a network request. So we're asking for information from somewhere else. And uh, what we're asking for is uh, the same thing that we threw into FileMaker earlier. I've just pasted uh, this URL in there, and that is where we get uh, the actual HTML that we saw earlier in FileMaker. Uh, and that's where our prices are that we're wanting to get. So uh, when this runs, uh, it's going to fetch the same thing that we saw earlier over here in FileMaker uh, with all of that uh, information. Now, as this workflow progresses, uh, as we can see, there's uh, several different wires between each element. And uh, that represents a pipeline um, of information from point to point. So uh, we start with our request here, and then it passes some information to here. This gives us new information that we can pass into the next, and so on and so forth. Uh, so what we're uh, doing is we're passing uh, what Node-RED likes to call a message. And uh, I will say that. Uh, I, I've been a developer for several years, uh, both FileMaker and uh, other languages as well. And I, this still tripped me up uh, <laughs> when I when I started working with Node-RED because um, uh, it, it was a concept that was unfamiliar to me. So if you're, if you're used to classic development environments, then um, it may be something that catches you off guard. All I can say is kind of just stick with it and uh, know that uh, these are well-tested principles and this is a uh, very good foundation upon, to which, upon which you can build 
uh, microservices. Um, but uh, what's going to get passed from each element is uh, something called a message. Um, and we'll see that expressed uh, quite clearly once we get to this uh, function uh, element here. But uh, for now, we're just going to go ahead and take a look at uh, the next uh, element here. Uh, and this is what we pulled in earlier. This is Cheerio. So um, like I mentioned uh, earlier, Cheerio is designed to parse all of that uh, information for us. So if we come back over to the uh, page here that has all of our prices, uh, we need a way to very easily address uh, the information that we're looking for. And uh, spreadsheets are a pretty natural uh, thing to humans. If I were to tell you that I wanted to know the latest price for city public service, you'd come along here and find the header that uh, has the CPS uh, ticker symbol here, and then you just go ahead and float all the way down to the bottom. Well, we, we need to describe that process to the computer as well. And as it turns out, it's not so different from the way that we as humans would, uh, would go ahead and uh, process that information. Uh, of course, the semantics that we're going to use to describe that are quite different, but uh, we'll make that clear as we go along. Um, in order for us to know um, confidently that we've got the right information, uh, we need to key on something that we know is always going to be consistent. And in this case, that would be the ticker symbol for um, our utility here. Um, this should not change um, for any foreseeable reason. Um, it should remain consistent on any report that uh, comes out of this particular entity. So we need to make sure that whatever column we're grabbing from always has this at the top. Um, and in that way, when we describe that to the computer, that means we need to know the uh, index number of this particular column. So if I were to count 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, we're looking for the 10th column. And uh, that is the first piece of information we need to establish. Uh, so how do we actually check to see uh, what is in that column? Well, um, again, this is a, a little bit of a uh, a little bit of a more verbose workflow uh, because we are doing it in a uh, sort of a low code environment. But um, all of that aside, uh, it is still an effective workflow. So um, we're going to break down the information that we're going to get into those two pieces. We first need to know the index of the column that we're grabbing. Um, and then after that, we can focus on actually getting the data out of the individual cells. Uh, so uh, what are we going to look at to actually identify this information? Well, if I right click here, and we dive into the inspector, we can see that uh, the information that we're looking for, and if I hover over this, we can kind of, uh, Firefox has a really nice uh, developer inspector where we can hover over these different things and kind of see uh, what's what. Uh, we can see that uh, this particular um, element here, which is a table header element, uh, has a class attribute of header value class. And we can specify that as what's called a selector inside of our Cheerio uh, workflow here. Uh, so when we specify a selector, we always do this with a period and then the, uh, well, this is a, if it's a class selector, we specify it with a period and then the class name. And that is uh, reflected just as if we were doing uh, pure JavaScript here. So um, if I were to clear my console and I said document.query selector, Actually, I'm going to do a query selector. And we refer to it by its class name. I would say header value class. And we can see that because we're using query selector, it's selecting the first item that matches this. It's found that particular item here. So this counts as a header. And if we hover over here, we can obviously see that as well. So we know that this is uh, going to give us a collection of the different uh, values that we want. We just need to make sure that we get the right one. So uh, what Cheerio is going to do is it's effectively going to scan through the information that it gets back from our HTML that's been collected. And it's going to dump it uh, into an array that we can reference um, with uh, each one of those headers as an item in that array. Um, so we can leave the rest of this uh, pretty well blank. I uh, am somebody who likes to label pretty much everything. So uh, I'll give it a name, and I've labeled it as get the text of all the headers. And we'll say done. Uh, of course, as we know, this wire indicates that it is piping that information to the next element. And if we click into here, 
uh, we've got a function. Well, now we're starting to touch an actual little bit of code, um, but uh, that's definitely not a reason to panic if you're not familiar with that. Uh, we uh, can absolutely walk through it and uh, figure out what's going on. Uh, so I talked earlier about how a message object is getting passed between each one of these elements. Uh, and here we can actually see that expressed quite clearly. So uh, this MSG um, object, uh, we, we don't see it really referenced anywhere other in the code. In fact, we're on line one here, and uh, already we have access to this MSG object. And uh, this is something that's globally available throughout uh, Node-RED. Uh, you can always reference this message object um, because that is uh, representative of the information that's getting passed from element to element. Um, and if we want the actual information that is in there, uh, that's going to be on the payload property. So in JavaScript, when we want to access a property um, of an object, uh, we use the dot, and then we reference the property name. So I'm assigning that information to a variable named headers. And then we're creating another variable here called the settlement index. Um, and if I wasn't clear, uh, these different uh, columns here are referred to as settlement points uh, within the vernacular of uh, the energy sector. And we're looking for the index, so the particular column that we're looking for. So we're referencing headers here, and I'm asking for the find index method. And what this is going to do is it's going to loop over every possible outcome that we saw here. So each one of these particular pieces of text, it's going to loop over it, and it's going to run a check. So um, we're taking the header, and I'm transforming everything that's there into lowercase. And the only reason I do that is because uh, it gives me an established baseline uh, to where I know that uh, I'm not dealing with any capital letters. Uh, you could also say two uppercase. I just prefer lowercase. Um, and then um, after that, we're running a check to see if it includes. And I'm looking to see if it includes this ticker symbol here that we already know is what I'm looking for. So basically, we're asking the system uh, where does uh, on what column does this match? And when you find that, give me the index. So uh, this variable that we've established is going to give me a number. And uh, now that I have that number, uh, we can assign that to be part of our message. So I can set a new property on message called the settlement index. And that will be equal to what we defined up here. Um, this in mind, uh, there's definitely some room to make this a little bit more terse. This could go here and here, but I'm, I'm not really going to focus too much on that um, because uh, that's not really the point of the session. Um, when we're done uh, assigning that property to our message, we do need to give that message back so that uh, the next uh, element that we pipe it into receives a copy of it. So this return statement down here, make sure that everything gets passed to the next uh, element. So uh, in that, uh, we're actually going to get the prices again. This is bad practice, without a, without a doubt. Um, there's no reason to be grabbing this information twice. We could have stored it up here. Um, but uh, for the purposes of just kind of uh, being verbose and explaining uh, what we're doing, I've gone ahead and just uh, added this as uh, basically a copy of what we did up here. Um, so we're getting that information again, and we're going to pass it once again uh, to uh, another instance of Cheerio. But instead of looking for that, uh, that header, uh, we're instead going to look for the last row of our table. Um, and this is pretty easy to do. If I go ahead and copy this selector and we come back over to our inspector, and I substitute this in for what I've copied, whoops. This should actually match on the uh, last value here. So if I hit return, uh, we can see that it actually should match what it is that we're looking for now. Uh, my window is kind of small here, so we're not really going to make uh, heads or tails of this. But uh, trust me, it is there. Um, so what we're basically asking for with the selectors, is we're asking for the last TR element, which a TR is a table row. Um, and uh, we're, we're asking for the last instance of that. Uh, followed by the table data um, element itself. Um, we're asking for every instance of this, this table data element. So um, once uh, Cheerio is done, it's going to return to us a collection of basically every single one of these cells here. And uh, we'll be able to key on that again in a similar method that we used before. 
so again, anything that uh, comes out of uh, this end goes into the next one. And uh, now I'm at my step where we can get the actual price from the row. Um, and because we already have our settlement index as part of this message property, um, sorry, this message object, uh, we can go ahead and get that. So the first thing that we're going to collect is we're going to collect our cells. So that is the individual um, collection of cells and their data from what we received in the last element. Um, and then we're going to uh, establish our settlement index. Now, uh, again, we don't have to do it this way. There's room to make this more terse, but I'm not really worried about it right now. And in the next step, uh, we're going to go ahead and set a message payload because we're getting to the end of our actual workflow here. And we're going to go ahead and set a message payload, um, which is set to be the actual price that we found in the cell. So um, referencing our cells variable here, which is an array, by uh, referencing it with these uh, square brackets, we're saying, I want whatever uh, value is at the index of whatever this matches. So um, that should match with number 10, and uh, that then should get the value of the cell at index 10 and set it as our message payload. Our last step is to return that message and pass it to our response here, returning as plain text. So. Um, that is pretty much the uh, entirety of the workflow. And if I go ahead and hit deploy, uh, we should be able to now use it. So if I pop back over to Hypernap and hit run, uh, we're getting 30.81. And let's see if that matches. This is the CPS column. And indeed, that is the current price of electricity trading per megawatt um, on the Texas grid. Uh, so what could we do with this information? Uh, well, if uh, we want to, we can put it into our FileMaker uh, database just as easily as we did here with HyperNAP. So I've still got my uh, endpoint programmed here uh, into my script step. If I hit play on that, then, and I probably should turn off that dialogue step, but if I hit play, we've now got actual live data uh, coming in uh, from uh, a, a known good source. So. Uh, this could prove useful in several situations. If your customer is, say, uh, something like a uh, recycling facility where they run an electrolytic or an induction furnace, uh, they could very well be paying an electrical rate that varies with uh, the current conditions of the market. Um, by providing this information to them, you could give them the ability to uh, predict their costs, uh, depending on what jobs they want to run at any given time. Um, something like uh, aluminum uh, has half the melting point of uh, iron, so uh, they could schedule jobs to that are going to be you know less uh, costly in terms of electricity. Um, they could, you know, in real time understand uh, what their costs are going to be as well as uh, see uh, what the current trend is if it's trending up or down based on the time of day. Uh, they can get a little bit more insight, uh, potentially saving saving them several thousand dollars. Um, a day and uh, ultimately adding up to uh, what could be potentially millions of dollars per year. So um, these kinds of, uh, being able to reference this kind of information uh, can really prove pivotal uh, to, um, to, to your customers. Um, and that's kind of where the, where the value add is. And this is of course just one approach of doing it, but um, my, it, it has definitely become my preferred approach to providing ancillary services like this uh, because I can count on the fact that this isn't going to break. Um, if somebody accidentally updates the server when they're touching something they don't want to or we forget to turn off automatic updates, one thing or another, I know that this is going to remain robust and on the off chance that something does break, um, it, it's not going to be a huge problem uh, because it, it will be uh, a matter of no time before before it gets resolved. So. Uh, some pretty cool stuff here with Node-RED. I definitely recommend checking it out um, uh, just because it, it can prove to be uh, quite a, a good asset to your customer. Like I said, this is one example of where you can scrape data. Um, there are several others um, uh, as long as you're mindful of those rules. Um, and my general approach to that is uh, follows along a couple of lines. Um, if the service offers an API, um, through which you can get data, but they also present the information on their website and then ask you not to scrape it, uh, don't scrape it. Um, if they have an API that uh, they're charging for, that is their source of income, and uh, that is uh, 
you know, scraping from the website when they've asked you not to is effectively that that's robbing them of income. Um, and uh, that's not something that's okay, uh, not something that I condone at all. Um, if they don't have an API, but they still ask you not to scrape their site, um, there are two routes you can go. Um, the, uh, the, the first is you can go and you know do it anyway. Um, the reason they're asking you not to, to scrape the site is because they don't want you to uh, impair performance, and th th that's something to be mindful of. If we're getting this number, we don't need to be getting it every five seconds, uh, primarily because this doesn't actually update every five seconds, um, but also because if we're doing that, uh, we run the chance that uh, we're now affecting the performance of the site for other users. And we, we don't want to be the source of a denial of service type situation, um, and uh, we certainly don't want to raise any red flags to the point that we actually can't get the information from the site. Um, so if they're asking you not to do it, generally that is, and, and they don't offer an API, a, a paid solution, that, that's generally going to be their reason is that they don't want it to affect the performance of the site. Uh, put quite honestly, most of the terms of use uh, that you'll come across on several sites um, are not actually written by the people who developed the site. They're just kind of boilerplate. So um, this do not scrape information has kind of become uh, something that just shows up because everybody's using the same template or a variant thereof. Um, but that, 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 sh that should be concern number one, is that if you're going to disregard that, um, that's up to you. Um, uh, I, I can't necessarily say I recommend it, but um, be mindful when you are doing this that you're not sending a request every five seconds or, heaven forbid, at an interval that's even more frequent than that. Um, you could affect the performance of the site, and you know that's not something that you want to do. Um, the next thing would be to uh, just ask, uh, quite honestly. Um, I've uh, done more than one application where uh, the customer with whom I was working said, hey, I really want this information. Uh, can you go out and get it for me? And uh, the particular vendor did not offer an API, um, but they also had that uh, uh, tagline on their site that said, hey, you know, don't, uh, don't scrape for data. Well, I got on the phone and talked to one of their technical directors, and he said, uh, yeah, well, you know, we don't care. Um, uh, he couldn't really tell me why that was there in the first place. Um, if it's uh, something from like a vendor um, where your customer is buying product and they want that as part of their coding system, um, in every situation I've worked in where that was the case, uh, the vendor was actually delighted to know that uh, their uh, their spot as a supplier was now secured into my customer's quoting system. So um, a lot of the times, if you want information, uh, your best uh, your best bet is to just ask and and get permission and make sure that uh, you know it's okay with the site. Um, but uh, always, in, in every case, do not bypass um, a paid API uh, through web scraping. It's uh, it's not the right choice to make um, as far as uh, you know being respectful of somebody else's uh, livelihood, their income. So um, those are just kind of the rules of thumb uh, when you're doing that kind of stuff. Um, but uh, again, where it's a vendor, whether it's local or even you know, a very large company, um, I have yet to have somebody tell me no when I did ask. So uh, keep that in mind. Um, so any questions on web scraping? Are there any particular uh, sources that you guys would like to see that look like? Um, anybody have any questions in that regard? If I don't get a response, I'll just take that as a no and move on. OK, sounds good. Um, all right, very cool. So uh, that's Node Red. Um, and uh, again, you can get that running uh, basically uh, just following the short steps that we ran through here. Um, and uh, there's a lot more that you can do with this uh, in terms of being able to parse out uh, uh, all kinds of information and uh, integrate with other services. So a really powerful tool um, and uh, honestly is, is a great jumping off point to be able to uh, move into, uh, into other resources. So. Um, super cool stuff here. Uh, David, how are we doing on time? Um, it's almost 820, so we probably should be wrapping up. OK. Um, well, I definitely did want to get to uh, some other stuff, but uh, you know, I am more than happy to do that uh, another time. Uh, this uh, kind of went on a little bit longer than I thought it would be, but I, I also think that it's a really good uh, approach um, if uh, uh, if you guys are, if anybody's new to this, um, then this is definitely a good jumping off point, and uh, uh, we definitely don't need to be moving into some of the the, the, the more complicated uh, concepts on uh, just kind of hitting this from the outset. Um, 
but uh, yeah, uh, at, at this point, I would say that uh, if we're, we're about ready to wrap up, um, that, that, that sounds good. And I'm glad that we got to review some of this and get to some of the cooler stuff. Um, if you guys have any questions, of course, uh, uh, please feel free. I'll, I'll stick around for a while. But otherwise, David, I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to present. And uh, I had a lot of fun. Thanks very much for presenting. This is really great. Um, I can definitely Absolutely. see Thanks. a lot of good so use cases for deploying microservices. Thanks, y'all. Sounds like there are some questions there. Uh, were there? <laughs> Todd, was that you? Were you asking something? I thought I heard somebody saying something. All right, maybe not. I'm muted now, or I don't know. We'll see. Okay. Uh, no, that was really great. Uh, you know, we deploy. PHP sometimes, and so this is this might be a good alternative to installing, you know, a PHP app on someone's server uh, by actually running PHP on there. Just put it, you know, packaged up as a microservice. Yeah, for sure. That's uh, uh, especially I think now with uh, um, now with uh, Claris kind of dropping support for PHP, I've I've had a couple of requests uh, come back uh, where where people are interested in uh, finding out how they can uh, get that uh, that functionality back because they did have uh, some things that were running with PHP. So uh, it'll be good to uh, kind of find another channel where they don't have to invest in additional hardware or a cloud server or something. So uh, super cool stuff for sure, yeah. Anyway, that's all I have. If you guys, okay. like I said, any questions or if you want to wrap it up, David, I'll pass it back to you. Uh, no, this was this was super informative. Thank you very much for coming on here and presenting. Also, I love your background. I see you oh, thank the, you. <laughs> the Laravel and the Claris neon lights. I think that's really cool and all the keyboards going. Yeah, yeah I wanted to get decorated for you all. Um, oh, and a PHP I, I think, uh, I didn't see that before. Yeah, there was we a, a need, doctor. The sledgehammer. Thank you for the sledgehammer. <laughs> Oh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Very cool. That's for sure. Uh, well, if you guys have any questions, uh, my uh, website doesn't really take you anywhere except to my GitHub page. But from there, you can find me on Twitter um, and a number of different other places. So feel free to reach out. I'm always happy to uh, uh, stay in touch and uh, see what everybody's up to. Thanks. Great. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you. Um, as always, everyone, we're always looking for presenters. If you have anything that you'd like to share, if you have uh, something cool that you've done that you want to show off, um, or if you have ideas for things that you'd like other people to present, something you want to know more about, um, or uh, you know some challenges that you've come into that you want to see uh, some some deep dives into maybe, uh, let me know. And we'll try to find someone who is interested in presenting on that topic. All those ideas are great. Uh, someone who wants to present is <laughs> uh, even more valuable, of course. Thanks, David. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, guys. Thanks a lot, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you.